Well, I know that we're in the Gospel of Luke this morning, but I want to begin with you by uh, telling you what most of you already know, and that is that in the Gospel of Matthew, really true of all the Gospels, but particularly in the Gospel of Matthew, the last few chapters detail the final days of the life of Jesus, beginning in about Matthew 21 and going all the way to Matthew 26, which is the, the crucifixion chapter, you have some detailed accounts of the activities of Jesus in the last week of his life. Uh, He's in Jerusalem, in and out of Jerusalem during that week, and he's teaching in the temple daily. And a lot of the teaching that Jesus is doing and a lot of the conversations that he's having involve tense exchanges with the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and others, um, these, these who have set about making it their business to discredit Jesus. In fact, Matthew chapter 22 and verse number 15, and you don't have to turn, I'll just read it to you, but Matthew twenty-two fifteen 15 says this. It says, Then the Pharisees went about taking counsel how they might entangle Jesus in his talk. He's in Jerusalem, in the temple, teaching, and they're asking him questions so that they might trap him. The word entangle in that verse means to entrap, to catch him off guard. And by asking him these questions, interrogating him, if you will, they're trying to put him in a position of setting himself in opposition to Moses, uh, causing him to say something that will be in defiance of the law. They're looking for opportunities to be able to take him into custody and ultimately, as you know, to have him uh, um, executed. Now, you know the story, right? Jesus is the Lord of life, the Lord of truth. And so he's not going to misspeak at any point. And so their, their entrapment efforts fail. And they end up having to, to pay money to some uh, low lowlifes, it's a biblical term, by the way, low lowlifes, who bring false accusations against Jesus because they can't entrap him. Well, They ask him questions that are intended to entangle him in his words. Questions like, um, if you go read the Gospel of Matthew, you'll see these. uh, Questions like, should we pay taxes to Rome? Is it it right for us to, to give tribute to Caesar? And they're trying to entrap him in affirming the rule of the Romans over the Jewish people. Um, they ask him a question uh, in that, uh, uh, those chapters about marriage and eternity. It's a, dis- it's a dispute between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They want to bring Jesus into it. Uh, in eternity, who will be married to whom? And then there's the question that most all of us are familiar with. It's the question of what is the greatest commandment in Matthew chapter 22. They say to him, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And of course, you know the answer, right? Jesus says, well, the the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God, love your heart, soul, and, and mind. And the second is like it, and that is that you are to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I tell you that. Because I want you to know that this question of which is the greatest command was a common question in Jesus' day. This was a question that was often disputed by the lawyers and the experts in the scriptures in that day. They would kick around these theological decisions or or, uh, discussions of what God viewed as the most important. And that question, which is the greatest commandment, is asked in the Gospel of Luke, in another way. It's it's the same question, but a lawyer poses it to Jesus in a different way. Let me show it to you. You're in Luke chapter 7. Go to Luke chapter 10, just a couple of pages forward. In Luke chapter 10, verse number 25, listen, listen to this question. Verse 25 says, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up, and tempted him. Again, these, these efforts to discredit him. A certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, tested him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Let me translate the question. What's really important? What are the commands? What's the greatest command? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, well, what is written in the law? What do you say? What do you read 
when you read the law, what do you see as the great commandment? And he gives the answer that Jesus gives in Matthew. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, uh, with all your soul, uh, and with all your strength, with all your mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. In verse 28, Jesus says, good, go do that. (laughs) Go do that perfectly and you will live. In verse 29, uh, he says, but he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? I want you to think about this question. This lawyer asks the question, who is my neighbor? Whom shall I love? Who is it that you want me, in obedience to God's great command, who is it that I should love? Now, we're going to spend some time on Sunday mornings over these next seven Sundays. We're going to be thinking together about who it is that Christ has commanded us that we are to love. Who is it that we are to love, in fact, like Jesus loves. And I'm going to seek, by God's grace and with the scriptures, to answer this lawyer's question. Who is my neighbor or whom shall I love? Over these weeks, we're going to learn to love like Jesus loves. Somebody said to me, they, I, I got an email a week or two ago and said, I, did I hear, did I miss here? Did you say that you were going to be, we were going to be talking about prophecy, about the coming of the Lord? And then I thought you said that, but then you said we were going to talk about loving like Jesus and just wondering. And I said, yeah, we are going to get to prophecy. That's going to happen nearer to the end of the year. But I said to this person, we got to get our love right before we take our heavenly flight. Amen? So this is our agenda. We're going to get our love right before that day comes, or at least before we study about the, the, the coming of the Lord. And I would suggest to you, by the way, that this is important. It's important because we've been commanded to love like Jesus loves, but it's also important because I would submit to you that there are few things that you might, few endeavors that you might engage in that will do more to enhance your witness or fill you with personal joy than this thing right here of loving like Jesus. And so may God help us to grow in love. And here's what we're going to discover over these weeks that as we, as we uh, learn to love like Jesus, we're going to discover that as, as we love like Jesus, we will care for the widows. Let me just begin right there. I'm going to give you the list of seven that we're going, to, we're going to talk about. As we learn to love like Jesus, we will care for the widows. And as we learn to love like Jesus, we will reach to the nations. And as we learn to love like Jesus, we will take in the orphans. And we will comfort the brokenhearted. And we will give to the poor. And as we learn to love like Jesus, we will welcome home the prodigals and we will heal the sick. We're going to talk about this over seven weeks. And it is my, it is my hope that in these weeks that we will learn to love and that this will not just be theoretical for any of us, but that we will actually take steps to love like Jesus. Let me make you a promise right now. Over these seven weeks, I am going to offer you, or our staff team is going to offer you, at least 20 different opportunities to show the love of Jesus to these particular people groups. In fact, I'm going to give you three opportunities today. Before you leave church today, you're going to have an opportunity to say, you know what, I can love on some people in one of these three ways. And so there should be no person on any of our campuses at the end of these seven weeks who is not actively, practically, tangibly loving on others like Jesus loves them. It's a hands-on experience we're going to have over these weeks together, and I hope you will put your hands to it. So in Luke chapter number seven today, we're beginning with this biblical imperative to love and to care for the widows. I want you to follow along as I read Luke chapter seven, beginning in verse number 11. Verse 11 says, and it came to pass, uh, it came to pass the day after that 
that Jesus went into a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him, and much people were following after him. Now, when he came near to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man being carried out. Uh, He was the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And much people of the city uh, were with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bier. And they that bear him, that is, they that bear the dead body of that, of that man, they stopped, they stood still. And Jesus said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. By the way, I should just stop and take a quiz. If you believe your Bible, shout amen. 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 He that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all of them. And they glorified God, saying that a great prophet has risen up among us and that God has visited his people. Um, I want you, if you're, a, if you're a note taker, you got a pen in your hand. I want you to underline in verse number 13, and then I want you to write somewhere in your notes this fact of verse number 13 that the Lord saw her. So we're talking about caring for the widows, loving the widows like Jesus loves the widows. And verse 13 tells us that the Lord saw her. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Now, when you read Luke chapter 7, let me just sort of give you some placement in the, in the timeline of the ministry of Jesus. We are relatively early still in his earthly three and a half years of ministry. And even though he has not been publicly proclaiming the message of the kingdom for very long or publicly performing miracles for very long, he is already, by the time you come to Luke chapter 7, he is already very well known in the region. Turn back maybe two pages to, to, uh, to Luke chapter 4. And as you, as you read forward from Luke 4 until where we are in Luke 7, you'll find that Jesus already has quite a following. He's already very well known. And he's, he's become well known because of two things. One, because of his preaching. And secondly, because of his miracles. And so listen, Jesus is well known, first of all, for his message, then for his miracles. The miracles came along to affirm the message. But Jesus didn't come with a hocus pocus and say, look what I can do. Now believe me, he came preaching the message of the kingdom and then confirming signs and wonders followed the message. The message was primary. And when you follow his his ministry, he's preaching in in the region of the Galilee. Um, Look at chapter 4 and verse number 14. Right after his baptism and his temptation, he begins his earthly ministry. Verse 14 says, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went a fame of him throughout all the region round about as he taught in their synagogues, uh, being glorified of all. So Jesus is teaching, and already his fame is beginning to spread. Look at chapter 4, verse 31. And he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he taught them on the Sabbath days, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for the word was delivered uh, with power. His word came forth with power. Uh, Look at verse 44, same chapter, uh, last verse of chapter 4. It says that he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. So all around this Galilee region, Capernaum is mentioned. We know that he's preaching in Nazareth in chapter 4, in the synagogue of Nazareth. Um, He's preaching in Magdala, the synagogue of Magdala on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, which, by the way, is where he cast seven demons out of Mary. Mary Magdalene came from Magdala. He preaches in Bethsaida. He preaches in Chorazin. All around this region, he's going from synagogue to synagogue, an itinerant preacher proclaiming the message of the kingdom. Look at chapter number 5 and verse 15. 
Because his fame is spreading, because his message is so powerful, verse 15 of chapter 5 says, but so much the more his fame went abroad of him and great multitudes came together to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. So along with the message, you have these miracles. And and again, as you read all of chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, you see him healing uh, those who are crippled. Um, you see him healing a, with, a man with a withered hand. He heals a leper. He casts demons out. And so his, he's becoming more and more and more famous. Look at chapter number 6 and verse number 17. It says, He came down with them, with, the, with um, uh, his disciples, and he stood in the plain along with the company of his disciples. And a great multitude of people came out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. That's up near um, Haifa today, up near Crete in the Mediterranean, uh, in the northern coasts of Israel. And they came to hear him. Chapter 6 records the Sermon on the Plain. You've heard of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. This is a different sermon, similar but different. A sermon, the Sermon on the Plain. And they come from all over, verse number 17 says, from Jerusalem and from Judea and from this northern coastal region of Tyre and Sidon. They come to hear his preaching and to be healed of their diseases. Verse 18 says, and they that were vexed with unclean spirits, they came and they were healed. Verse 19, and the whole multitude sought to touch him for there went virtue out of him and he healed them all. It's an amazing verse that, that the message is going forth and people are being healed in mass. And so there's, it's no surprise when you arrive in chapter 7 that Jesus is being followed, the Bible says, by this great crowd of people. Did you, did you see it in verse number 11? It, I'm back in chapter 7. It came to pass the day after that he went into the city called Nain and many of his disciples, not just the 12, but many followers of his dozens, maybe upwards of 70 or more now are beginning to be gathered in that disciple group. And then much people, those who hadn't yet thrown their lot in it with him necessarily, but they're receiving the message and they're being touched by him. Many people, many disciples and much People are with him. It's not surprising that that because of his message and because of his miracles, when he arrives in the village of Nain on this particular day, he's got this crowd, this host of people following along with him. Now, only Luke records, of all the gospel writers, only Luke records this raising of this dead man in the city or the village of Nain. This is the first of three resurrections that Jesus performs during his, during his ministry. Only three people. Jesus healed multitudes, but he only raised three people from the dead that the Gospels tell us about. There could be others, but we don't know about them. The Bible tells us about three. There's the daughter of Jairus, there's Lazarus, of course, and then this man in the village of Nain, who we don't know his name, um, but we read about him in, uh, in Luke chapter number 7. This is the first that he's going to raise. And so for the first time, this preacher, this healer, now is going to show himself to be the life giver. And when he arrives in Nain, he comes to the city gate, the Bible says, and you have the clash of two crowds. And I want you to think about this. You've got Jesus, the, the preacher and the healer, all these people following him, Can you imagine they're rejoicing and they're excited and they're happy because the kingdom has come and this great leader, this prophet, maybe they haven't yet understood him to be the Messiah, but at least they think this great prophet has come and they're excited and they're coming with perhaps with flutes playing and and joy as they arrive at Nain and they get to the city gate and they meet another crowd and that crowd's not as happy because this is a funeral procession coming out. And the Bible tells us that there are many people, verse number 12, many people coming in this funeral procession. So they're coming out of the city, he's coming into the city, and they run into each other at the city gates. The happy, joyful crowd and the solemn, weeping crowd. 
And this is hundreds of people. I have no doubt it's, it's hundreds of people who are coming together at this city gate. And amongst all of that that noise and that jostling and that busyness and, and one crowd happy and the other crowd sad, in the, in the middle of all of that maybe kind of crowded chaos, there's one brokenhearted, weeping mama because she's attending the funeral procession of her son. And I want you to see in verse number 13, you've already underlined it and you've written it down, but I want you to see that the Lord saw her. Can I get a witness? Are you glad Jesus sees you in the deepest valleys of your life? He cares. He saw her. When, when maybe nobody else would have seen her, maybe nobody else in the crowd would have recognized that she was the mother. You know, some of those that would have been with her that day were what we would sort of term as professional mourners. They would just they were the people that would come to every funeral and they would mourn. They would just come and wail and mourn. Still happens today in, in some parts of the world. And so who, who's the mother? Who's the professional mourner? But Jesus saw this woman. And the text tells us some things about her. We, we know a couple of things about her. Verse number 12 tells us that she is a widow. Verse 12, when he came to the gate of the city of Nain, behold, there was a dead man being carried out. He was the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Now, her husband had died. And, and to be sure, that is a tragic loss for any wife in any time in history but for those widows in the first century, it was particularly a great loss because this widow of Nain and so many others like her in her day would become, when they became widows, they would become, write this down, they would, they would become rather invisible. This is one of the reasons it's so significant that Jesus saw her because widows in that day would become what I call invisible. Now, by that, I simply mean to say that women in the first century, and really throughout so many points of history, but certainly in the time of Jesus and in this part of the world, women drew their identity almost exclusively from the men to whom they were connected. And so a, a young woman would draw her identity from her father, Completely. She would be the, the daughter of her father, his, his virgin daughter. His life, his family name would be her identity. To some extent, her brothers as well. But it would be the men in her life that would give her her identity. Ultimately, when she would marry, then that identity would shift from her father to her husband. And she would, for the rest of her life, for the rest of her married life, would draw her identity from this husband. And again, to some degree, from her sons. But if it's her father or her brothers or her husband or her sons, women in that day would draw their identity from the men to whom they were connected. And so when a wife would lose her husband, when she would become a widow, and particularly if she was a childless widow in, in a really true way, that woman would lose her personhood in some ways. It's very different from today, but this is the world in which she lived. One of the places that you see this, it becomes so clear, uh, is in Isaiah chapter 4. Don't turn, but in Isaiah 4, you have this, this prophecy where Isaiah says that there's coming a day of, of warfare, a day of battle, when so many men will die or, or, uh, in, in battle that Isaiah says seven widows, seven widows will compete for one man and they will say, take away our reproach. What's the reproach? It was the reproach of no longer having a husband from whom they would gain their identity. This is the plight of this woman. Her husband is gone. She's lost her identity in so many ways. And because of that, it is great grace that the Lord saw her. Now, 
I think you will agree with me that we often fail to realize how widows and, and the elderly, generally speaking, oftentimes feel invisible. Because so often, the world passes them by, including their families. Because we go on about our lives, those who are younger and stronger and more active and busier and in some ways perhaps more productive. And we go on with our lives and these widows, and again, the elderly in general, can feel unseen, un loved, that they just don't matter anymore. And so Jesus comes into this village of Nain, and he sees this woman. And I would suggest to you that we begin, we take the first step in loving like Jesus when we take time to see the widows around us the elderly around us. She had become invisible, yet Jesus saw her. The second thing that we know about her from verse number 12 is that not only is she invisible, but she's vulnerable. Now, let's talk about her vulnerability. Verse number 12 says, when he came nigh to the, city of the, uh, the gate of the city, there was a, a dead man being carried out. It's a dead man. It, it's his funeral. He is, the man who has died, is the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. So her husband's died, now her son has died. And because of the loss of her husband and now the loss of her son, she has lost her means of provision, of, of having what she needs to survive. Under the law, there are exceptions to this, but without getting into those rare exceptions, under the, under the law of Moses, childless widows, childless widows, would often become destitute. They had no means of providing for themselves. They, the, the widow would have no right to inherit the, in, the, the land, the inheritance of her husband, her, her dead husband. She would have no right to receive that. It would have to be received through a son. And if the son is dead, then she's lost that right. Outside of the law of leveret marriage, which didn't always work. Sometimes it was impossible because there were no brothers. And other times it was just the brothers would not fulfill their, their obligation or their, their uh, law, their obligation under that law. Outside of that, these widows had no real legal recourse. They had no real legal rights. As a result of this, they had no means to provide for themselves, and they would often, almost always, be completely dependent upon generosity of others, upon the charity of others to, to keep them uh, surviving. In fact, don't you know this from a verse in the New Testament? What verse might I be thinking of in the New Testament which talks about widows? It's James chapter 1. James 1, 27 says this, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless, the orphans, and the widows in their affliction. In their affliction. Well, the word affliction means their distress. It means they're, it, literally the word means they're very difficult circumstances. And so what James is affirming is that widows in that day were in distress. They weren't living comfortably. They needed God's people to visit them, to care about them. And in fact, James says that when we do that, we are, we are demonstrating, we're giving evidence of authentic Christian faith. Jesus comes to Nain, he, he encounters this woman who is, has become invisible, she's lost her identity in so many ways, she's lost her provision, she's vulnerable, and Jesus sees her in that situation, and he loves her. Now, I, I should stop and say, by the way, that though this was the plight of widows in that day, God cares, jot this down somewhere just so you don't misunderstand, God cares for the widows. And throughout the scriptures, God makes provision for widows to, to have their needs met because of their, of their invisibility and their vulnerabilities. He makes provision. 
Um, what's a good Old Testament text that would teach us about the provision of God for widows? It would be the book of rhymes with youth. It starts with an R. It's the book of Ruth. Yeah, you can say it more confidently. Ruth! It's the book of Ruth where you see God's provision for the widows. Uh, you also learn something about the, the distress of Naomi as a result of the death of her husband and her sons. But, but through the kindness of Boaz and the commandment of the law that those who were poor widows were allowed to go into the fields and reap the corners of the fields and reap behind the, uh, the reapers uh, that they would have what they would need. So God made provision under the law uh, for uh, charity and generosity for the widows. You also, by the way, see that Jesus made provision for his mother, didn't he? From the cross, when he's dying, just before his death, he, he commends uh, Mary's care into the hands of John so that she, as a widow, obviously Joseph is dead at that point, that she as a widow would be taken care of. Uh, in the early days of the church, in Acts chapter number 6, the, the infant church in Jerusalem structured itself, really, uh, specifically for the care of widows. You go read Acts chapter 6, you'll find uh, how that they are tending to the needs of widows in the church. And in 1 Timothy chapter 5, God gives, through Paul's pen, very specific and detailed instructions about the care of widows within the church as well as, listen carefully, the conduct of widows within the church. Now, I won't take the time to turn and read it, but you can go read it later. 1 Timothy 5, here's what you'll find. That widows are to be cared for, first of all, by their families. But he's very clear in 1 Timothy 5 that the church is not to be charged with caring for a widow if that widow has family, sons or daughters, that have the ability to care for her. And then secondly, that if that doesn't exist, if she is a widow indeed, that is she has no one else to help her, then it is the responsibility of the church to do that. But also, also in 1 Timothy 5, uh, if y'all are listening, shout amen. amen. She, Paul says in 1 Timothy 5 that widows have a great opportunity to minister to the church. And that they ought, to, they ought to be servants within the church. And they ought to be showing hospitality. And they ought to be prayer warriors. And so there's always been this special place of care of widows within God's, within God's plan, within his people. But there's also always been this special place of service that widows have. In fact, one of the, one of the first people to welcome the Lord Jesus to the earth was a was a widow of 84 years by the name of Anna in the temple when he was brought there uh, by, his, by his parents. And so the point is, Jesus saw this widow, and like Jesus, we need to see those around us, those widows and the elderly around us. Now, the second thing that Jesus did, back to Luke chapter number 7, is that the Lord saw her, number one. Then secondly, the Lord had compassion on her. You'll see this in verses 13 and 14. He had compassion. Uh, it says, when the Lord saw her, then he had compassion on her. Now, now here's how we begin to love practically. You can see a widow, uh, an elderly person, and, and you can say, I, have, I, I see that person. That's good. That's a first step. But seeing ought to lead to doing, right? We begin to love when we are moved in our hearts by what we see, by the need that we see. Well, verse 13 says Jesus saw her, and after he saw her, he then had compassion for her. It means to feel sympathy for, to be moved inwardly for. And so Jesus had compassion on her. And as a result of that, notice what he did. Verse 13, he had compassion on her, and he said to her, weep not. Now, again, I, I don't pretend to know because the text doesn't tell us exactly. So I don't pretend to know exactly what this looked like. But obviously, Jesus is speaking face to face with her. I just imagine that he pulled her close, that he just drew her up close to him, whispered. Remember, it's a big crowd, lots of noise. He pulls her up close. He says, don't cry. It's okay. All hope is not gone. For her, all hope is gone. 
Her husband's dead. Now her son is dead. She's going to be destitute. She's grieving the loss. She's uncertain about her future. She's becoming more and more invisible. She's now certainly vulnerable. And this preacher, whom I have no idea that she knows who he is or even has heard his name, he pulls her close and says, don't fear, don't weep. He speaks kindly to her. By the way, one of the greatest things you can do to show the love of Jesus is to speak kindly, especially to the elderly. Sometimes we speak harshly, but we need to speak kindly to them. He, he spoke kindly to her. Then he approached her, pulling her close. He moved toward her, not away from her. We can follow that example. And then he, he stopped the funeral procession. Now, the Bible says in verse number, thir- or verse number 14 that he touched the beer. Uh, it means it's just a it's um it's not a coffin as we envision a coffin. Uh, it's really just a stretcher on which you would lay the dead body wrapped in linens. If you want to see it, go today and Google um, Palestinian funeral. You see this in the Palestinian community all the time, where they will walk through the streets carrying on their shoulders a stretcher with a dead body. Oh, you don't see the body; it's all wrapped in linens. But this is exactly what was happening in Nain. They were carrying this body. Jesus is a rabbi. Rabbis don't touch dead bodies or the, or the stretchers carrying dead bodies, lest they be defiled. But Jesus stepped forward and he touched it. And when he did, they were like, oh! And they just stopped. The whole funeral procession came to a halt. They just stopped. Jesus takes this woman. If y'all are with me, say amen. amen. Don't wait. Then he looks at her son. Young man, I say unto thee, arise. And he sat up, amen, and began to speak and probably said, what is going on? <laughs> How did I get back here? But he sat up and began to speak. Here's what I want you to know. Jesus saw her and then he moved in with compassion. This is how we love like Jesus. We see first. And then we move in with compassion. The third thing that Jesus did is the Lord helped her. The Bible says in verse number 14 that he touched the the bier and they that bear him stood still. And he said, young man, I say unto thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. Look at verse 15 at the end of it. It says, and he delivered, he then delivered this dead man to his mother. I imagine them putting that that stretcher down, this, this young man is helped up. Remember, he's wrapped in linen. They, they get him unwrapped, and uh, he stands up, and he, he, in whatever way that looks like, he just says, here's your boy. He just gives her what she had lost. He provided to her what she no longer had. And here's what I want you to see as I close. It is that in that moment, Jesus saw this woman, had compassion, moved in toward her, And then he did for her what he could do. He raised her son from the dead. And in the same way, if we're going to love like Jesus, we can do for the widows, for the elderly, we can do what we can do. We can't raise the dead. We don't have that power. But like Jesus did what he could do, if we're going to love them, we can do the things that we can do. Let me tell you what are the three greatest needs of widows and elderly. I'm using that as a general term, but widows and elderly, what are the three greatest needs that they face? Um, You might jot them down. Number one is companionship. Uh, Just someone to visit, to call, to talk. Uh, So many of them are so alone. Companionship. Number two is transportation. Many of them can no longer drive. Um, and they need transportation. They need help getting to important appointments and such. Maybe to buy groceries or whatever, but they need transportation. And the number three is projects. Um, this is just simply things that perhaps they used to be able to do or a husband could do, and now that husband is gone, and, and so they just can't do it. It it's a, might be a small project to... I don't know, uh, replacing a floodlight outdoors or putting up a security camera. It's not a big deal, but it's not something they can do. Or it might be something larger than that, rebuilding a set of steps or putting in a a ramp. Uh, 
so that they can get in and out of their home. But whatever it is, these are the three, whatever it looks like, these are the three needs. Just someone to be there, someone to help them get where they need to get, and someone to help them be able to live in their home. So let me tell you what we're doing. We're going to do what we can do. I'm not going to challenge you to raise the dead. But I am going to challenge you to meet one of these three needs. Today, we are going to begin building three teams to serve widows and the elderly. We're going to build a visitation team. Literally a team that just says, you know what? I can spend some time with someone who needs a person to spend some time with them. Number two, we're going to build a transportation team. People who will say, you know what, I can, I can invest an hour or two to take a person where they need to go. And then thirdly, and this would be men primarily. And guys, I challenge you to this. And I don't mean to say that women couldn't do it, of course. But when we think about a build team, uh, we're thinking about men who have the ability to say, you know what, I can, I can do projects or I can help with projects. And we're going to ask you to be a part of one of these three teams. Jesus did what he could do. Let's do what we can do. And that will show love. Now, there are two ways that you can let us know that you'd be willing to be a part of one of these teams. One is you can text. They're going to put a number up on the screen. You can text the word widow. We're talking about caring for the widows today. You can text the word widow to 828-518-2208. Just text widow. That's all you've got to do. It'll reply with a link where you will be able to choose which of these three teams you would be interested in serving on. And then you submit that, and we'll be in touch with you. The other way, if you don't want to do it by text, and uh, you say, well, I'm not that uh, quick with the phone, or I'm not that tech savvy, uh, we have an old school way for you to do it, and that is in the hallway today. There is a table, and a couple of pastors are going to be at that table as soon as we dismiss. And you can go by there, and you can put your name on a sign-up sheet, and by doing that, you're saying, you know what? I can serve, I can love the widows like Jesus loves the widows. Remember, God cares for the widows. He's always made provision for them. And it may be that in a widow's life, right in this season, you are God's provision for them. 